so this dot point is the learning environment. Uh, so we're going to continue with our major learning goal here for this uh, critical question, and that is to understand the judgment of skill and how the stages of skill acquisition and the characteristics of the learner and the environment impact skill performance. Our success criteria is to evaluate the various methods of judgment and explain the impact of the stages of skill acquisition, the characteristics of the learner and the environment on performance. Uh, for this particular dot point, we have our sub goals, uh, which are for you to know the nature of specific skills, for you to understand the performing elements, for you to know the different types of practice methods and how to provide feedback, and for you to be able to design a, pl um, for you to be able to design a plan to develop skills from the cognitive stage through to the autonomous. Our success criteria to go along with this is for you to define and provide examples of the different types of skills, for you to explain how performance elements affect performance, and for you to explain how different methods of practice and feedback affect skill acquisition and performance. Of course we've got a learn about to go with this content, so our learn about straight from the syllabus is quite big, and it's to, for you to know the learning environment uh, and so our learning environment is the nature of the skill, so that can be open, closed, gross, fine, etc. Uh, the performance of the, uh, sorry, the performance elements, uh, decision making, strategic and tactical developments, uh, your practice methods, massed, distributed, etc. And then of course your different types of feedback, which include internal, external, or a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, you'll learn two to go with this uh, dot point. It requires, it requires you to design a suitable plan for teaching beginners to acquire skill through to mastery. Uh, now the plan should reflect appropriate practice methods for the learners at their various stages, the integration of relevant performance elements, uh, and awareness of how instruction may vary according to characteristics of the learner, and how feedback uh, will be used as learners progress through the stages of skill acquisition. Now if you want to see an example of that, please feel free to go and uh, visit the website pdap.net and you'll find on there a sample uh, of a designed um, plan for teaching beginners to acquire a skill through to mastery. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is the nature of the skill. The nature of a skill has various components to it. Uh, so any skill can be either open or closed. Okay, so the open skill is performed in a constantly changing environment, whereas the closed skill uh, is performed in the same conditions every single time. So an example of an open skill is batting in cricket. Uh, there's the weather, there's the bowler who's bowling, whether it's spinning or what the pitch is like, what kind of bat you're using. Uh, whereas the same conditions would be swimming because a lot of, uh, particularly elite level swimming, uh, requires uh, the set temperature of the pool, a 50 metre pool, uh, and that's always the same conditions for the performance. Another component of the nature is for it to be gross or fine. Now a gross motor skill is, involves large muscle groups, uh, so it could be a big bench press, it can be running, uh, involving lots of different muscles all at once. Uh, or the skill can be a fine motor skill, which essentially means that it's using smaller isolated muscles. Uh, so that could be shooting, where you're just really pulling your trigger and holding everything steady, uh, or it could be dart throwing. Uh, there you're looking at some finer motor skills rather than the gross ones, which are using a lot larger movements. The nature of the skill continues. Not only can you say that a skill is open and gross, such as cricket, or fine and closed, such as throwing darts, uh, and you can also say that the skill is discrete, serial, or continuous. And now a discrete skill uh, has a clear beginning and end, such as a backflip in gymnastics. Uh, a serial skill often combines a number of separate smaller skills uh, into a more complex skill to be performed uh, and so our example of a basketball layup is really great for a serial skill because you're combining dribbling, running, jumping and shooting into one skill which is called a layup. And then of course there's continuous. Now continuous skills are skills that repeat the same movements over and over and over again such as running, cycling or swimming. Now in addition to that we can then also add self or externally paced skills. So our self-paced skills, the timing and speed of the skill performed is determined by the person who is performing it. Uh, so the athlete is in charge of when they kick that penalty uh, kick in football. Okay? Uh, but it can be externally paced as well, which is determined by external factors 
such as our example of batting in cricket, which be an externally paced uh, skill. It would probably also be um, a discrete skill because it has a clear beginning and end to it. Uh, our batting example is going to be a gross motor skill because you're using large muscles with a big movement uh, and it's going to be an open uh, skill performed in various different contexts. Okay, whereas our dart throwing is a closed fine motor skill Again, it's going to be discrete, it has a beginning and an end, uh, and it's going to be self-paced uh, because the person throwing the darts has complete control over the pace at which it's done. We then shift to looking at the performance elements. So in any performance of a skill, uh, we need to have the person thinking about lots of the other aspects. So decision making is really important in any kind of performance. Uh, so decision making are the, those decisions that are made during a performance. Uh, so it's when the person has to decide whether they're going to do a short pass, a cutout pass, uh, or whether they're going to run themselves and hit that line. So that's someone making decisions in the game. And so uh, athletes who are at the higher end of their performance are better at making those decisions on the field. The autonomous stage of skill acquisition lends itself really well for being able to make decisions on the field in relation to what you're seeing in front of you. Uh, in addition to this, we also have strategy and tactical development. Now, strategy is the overall method used to achieve the goal. Uh, so that might be when you're looking at winning uh, a whole season worth of um, rugby or football. It could be winning the uh, set competition for tennis. And you come into that competition with your own strategy for how you're going to go about winning. Uh, and it normally has to do with your own strengths um, and can be very seasonal or team specific. Uh, so if it's a tennis example, uh, then you're going to have your athlete who performs in one competition. If it's team, it's your team's performance going into that and working to your strengths and even your own individual strengths. Your tactical development is slightly different. Tactical development is about gaining an advantage over an opposing player. And so it's essentially about knowing their weaknesses and targeting them. Uh, so it has to do with game sense and decision making. And it's more one-on-one -on -one or team v team. Uh, than it is that overall goal of you know, our approach to the season or our approach to this competition. It's now going to, uh, this is my approach to the competition, but now I've got to defend this particular player, this is how I'm going to do it. I've got to attack this particular player, this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, or even if it's a team sport, this is uh, the strengths of that whole team and this is uh, how we're going to deal with that strength and how we're going to go about uh, attacking them with their weaknesses. But at the, same time, at the same time, you're going to use your own strategy, which is working on your strengths. So really key here, I'm going to stop and pause. Strategy is about your strengths. Tactical is about your opposition's weakness. We then move into practice methods. Whenever you're developing a skill, there are various different types of practice or practice methods. Uh, and some of them are going to be better suited for particular skills and for particular learners, uh, depending on what stages they're at in their stage of skill acquisition. So practice methods, uh, so practicing can be either massed or it can be distributed. Mass practice is continuous practice session uh, with smaller rest periods than practice intervals. Uh, so lots and lots of long time spent practicing. Uh, this is normally used for skilled and motivated athletes because it can get quite boring uh, and you want to be able to do it in multiple different contexts. Uh, your distributed practice is where you have short periods of practice with longer breaks in between it. Uh, often used for less skilled athletes because it's very mentally draining for them to learn that new skill uh, and less motivated athletes or particularly if the skill is boring to learn uh, then you might distribute and uh, distributed can be not just a rest period you could even have the athlete go uh, shoot two layups and then go and practice their dribbling go and do some shuttle runs come back and do some more layups go and shoot some three pointers and then they come back and do some more layups. Uh, and so the distributed doesn't mean that they're doing nothing in between, it just means that they're not doing that same skill over and over again. And practice can also be whole or it can be part. So a whole practice is when you are practicing the skill in its entirety. Uh, so the entire skill all at once, you're going in and you're performing that layup, you're going in and you're performing that layup. So the whole thing all at once. Uh, it's used for discrete skills particularly, um, or for continuous skills. So if you're going to do swimming, for example, you just swim and swim and swim. It's not normally used for uh, your serial, uh, yeah, it's not normally used for your serial skills such as layups, uh, but it can be. 
and then your part. Your part practice is when you're going to take the skill and break it down into its smaller components. And the athlete's going to learn each component first and then combine them together in order to perform their skill. And that's why uh, basketball and those serial skills which are made up of smaller components or smaller skills and then put together are often begun with by teaching the cognitive staged skill acquisition person. Uh, you're going to teach them using this broken down part method where you're going to teach them to dribble the ball first, then you're going to teach them to run with the ball, and then you're going to teach them to run and, then, and jump with the ball, and then you'll teach them to shoot with the ball, and then you'll combine them all together into a layup. Uh, that's very much uh, the way that you teach it. And then once a person gets good at the layup, you can then do it as a whole. Um, whereas something like swimming is normally just taught as a whole, and then you might adjust slight things in their skill. Another thing you have to consider when you're looking at developing skill and uh, how astute athletes are going to progress along the stages of skill acquisition is feedback, when to use it, what different type to use in order to get your best uh, results. So feedback provides direction, provides goals, and it corrects technique. Uh, feedback can be uh, either internal or external. So internal feedback comes from the performer and normally that's going to be your autonomous performer who can feel that they're actually performed that skill incorrectly. Uh, it's not normally going to be your cognitive stage performer. Uh, it can also be external. So external means that the feedback is coming from someone or something else uh, that is apart from the performer. Now that can be a coach, but it can also include videos, it can include sounds, it can include knowledge of uh, what happened, so your results. Uh, did the ball go in? Uh, that's an external source of feedback. So feedback internal or external. Feedback can also be concurrent or delayed. Now concurrent feedback happens during the performance. So that autonomous athlete who knows that they're performing that skill slightly incorrectly can actually fix it during their performance. Uh, or the coach might stop you mid golf swing to correct how you're holding uh, this club before you continue to execute that skill. That's concurrent. And then there's delayed feedback. Delayed feedback is feedback that comes after the performance. So you shoot your free throw in basketball and then you see that you missed. That's happened after your performance. Or maybe you shoot your free throw in basketball and then you go and watch a video of what your technique looked like. That's delayed feedback. It's also going to be external feedback. Uh, and then you move on to knowledge of results or knowledge of performance. So knowledge of results is all about the outcome. Did the ball go in the hoop? When I kicked it, did it get to the person I was trying to pass the ball to? Uh, whereas our knowledge of performance is all about uh, getting told or seeing something that gives us feedback about the process of movement. So normally that's your technique. Uh, so you might watch a video of your technique and compare it to someone who is very skilled and very technical in the sport to see how you're progressing and correcting your technique. Uh, normally it comes from a coach or from video analysis.